very early on in the project, I, I, I chose some music from from Wagner, which is the uh, pre prelude to uh, Tristan and Isolde. That is not what you would consider melancholic music. That is what you would call romantic music. That has kind of somehow uh, tur turned the whole thing into a very romantic film also in the images and stuff. It is highly romantic. Ladies and gentlemen, we've waited a while for this. A toast to the bride and the groom. Justine and Michael. Justine, Justine and Michael. We've gone for some very, uh, like, yellow, very uh, warm, very warm feel, uh, kind of uh, trying to make uh, happiness, a uh, feeling of happiness and and party. And then in the second part of the film, we've gone more blue, uh, more melancholic. I started by using the handle camera to make it easier for the actors, actually. So what can I say without talking about your mother? To have a camera that kind of, that the actors didn't, they shouldn't know where the camera was. So they didn't kind of uh, had to, to try to look good from one side or, you know, all this or play to the camera or whatever. <laughs> We're going to move to the living room so that we can clear some tables. Um, then the newlywed will dance. From Dogma, uh, we, we had some rules about the, that, that we wanted to make a film that looked more like a documentary. And now it's, 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 it's kind of a, a thing that you could say it's kind of now, nowadays it's considered to be very conservative. It's, if it's still a handle camera, that's something you did, you know, 10, 20 years ago. But for me, it gives a life and, and kind of a, a vibration. <laughs> My goal was to operate the camera myself, but it seems it, it was a, I, I wasn't up to it. Lars's guidance concerning my handheld work was mainly um, telling me not to um, to refine my uh, my movements. Uh, he was he's very he's always looking into uh, faults and mistakes and. And uh, so, as a as a cameraman, you usually uh, uh, second time you do a take, you have kind of uh, there's always something from the first time you want to do better. And Lars, you would spot that right away, and he would say, "Don't do that. Don't don't refine. Just uh, go. F keep up following the follow the energy, follow the acting, follow the. Don't worry about." Uh, Mistakes. I love mistakes. Mistakes are, uh, uh, are gifts. It's very much about uh, being intuitive all the time and kind of refresh your mind every time you do a take. And so, in that sense, I think uh, the camera work can be probably be kind of like uh, acting. Uh, I think one of the basic things in Lars von Trier's camera style is that the camera must not know anything of what's going on. It has to react instantly or impulsively instinct, uh, uh, to what's happening. And, uh, um, and, and, and we do that by not preparing anything, by and, but even the actors, they don't know what to do. They, they don't get any directions for the first take. 
you do the first take and nobody knows anything. They just do whatever they believe is uh, written in the script, what's written in the script, and, and then Lars adjusts from there. <laughs> So you never do what you would call traditional coverage. You would never go in and pick up a close-up or anything like that. You you will uh, you do um, uh, masters where the camera, docu in, like in documentary style, tries to catch what's going on. I'm sure if people get seasick. Um, it's a little bit like if if you look at the frame all the time, and it's a handheld camera, then you get really seasick. But but if you kind of go so much into the film that you look at <laughs> what is inside the frames and not the framing itself, then I think you're okay. It's like you know when you when you when you drive a car, you seldom get uh, you know sick from <laughs> driving. Well, very early in the process, we started looking at, at large-scale uh, destruction, and I showed uh, Lars some of my favorite scenes of, like, uh, the end of the world. And for one of them, which is a fairly uh, well-known scene of, uh, of uh, nuclear war, I showed it to him, and he just looked at me and said, OK, now you know everything about what this movie should not look like. So, some of the shots in the film are with a lot of special effects, even though you, you, you don't see as so much as special effects. But, but when you do that, you, you probably, or you would normally put, them, put the camera on a stand and do it as a fixed shot. And then after that, when you have done the work, you would kind of put a little uh, movement to it. And it lifts the scene so much. My God. For Melancholia, we have been trying to stay away from the most complicated uh, uh, types of effects work, especially for the shooting. It was a very simple shoot, and much uh, of the effects was done with the physical uh, stuff on the set and with the in-camera effects, and only a very few shots have uh, advanced sort of CGI uh, effects. Could be a bit up at the plan. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. In five minutes, it'll be smaller. What we're trying to do is to do something that works with the psychology of the characters and, and with the viewer. And I think it's very strong because we take our time uh, for sort of the build-up. This is uh, close to how you would experience uh, something like a large-scale catastrophe yourself, that maybe you would sense the building up of something, and then the event itself would be very short and uh, violent. We've, of course, been using some uh, computer-generated uh, images, but most of that is uh, what, we, what we call simulation-based Im images, which means that it's a simulation of real physical processes that is then rendered into an image. And that's what we've been using for the most complicated parts of the, of the film. Lars has a very definite uh, genre or, or like a whole new visual identity for each uh, project. So uh, for that, it's a new beginning, but working with Lars is, uh, is an experience that I'm enjoying over and over locally.